Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 410 of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, I have with me Doreen Edelman. Doreen is a partner at Lowenstein Sandler in Washington. She's also a global trade and policy expert. Before I introduce the episode, I would like to ask if you've ever been interested in starting a podcast, if you'd like to be on part of a podcast, part of a great network of podcasts, consider joining the Compliance Podcast Network. If you're interested, please enjoy this brief announcement from our sponsor today, One Stone Creative, about the podcast production process. If you are enjoying this show, you might enjoy hosting your own. As an expert in your field, you have skills, knowledge, and insight that can help you expand your practice, meet new people, and create amazing content to share with the world. In as little as two hours a week, you can dramatically change how you promote, fill, and position your business, and One Stone Creative can show you how. Learn more at onestonecreative.net. Today's episode is the first part of a two-part episode with Doreen, and we take up the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. It has become a very much more prominent, uh, certainly under the Trump administration, and Doreen details for us what has changed with CFIUS, how to ensure yourself a, how to prepare for a CFIUS review, and what it will entail. It's a fascinating exploration of something that's going to become more and more important as this administration uses trade policy as a cudgel to bludgeon America's allies and its foes. I know you will find it useful, something that compliance officers need to be aware of. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. And now, Doreen Edelman on CFIUS for the Compliance Professional, Part 1. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode. And you're in for a real treat today because I have back with me Doreen Edelman. Doreen is now with Lowenstein Sandler. I hope I got that right. Um, and But she's still in trade compliance. And we are here today to talk about a, a topic that every compliance practitioner, businessman, and corporate lawyer needs some knowledge of. And that is, I'm just going to call it CFIS. So with that, uh, Doreen, uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. You're very welcome. First thing, I'm sorry, Tom, if you don't mind, uh, it's there's no right way to pronounce an acronym, I suppose, but CFIUS is what the uh, government people call it. it well, I guess it sounds uh, less intimidating that way because okay. many have said it sounds like a disease. <laughs> well, it may be, but, uh, you know, when all of those, there were all of those attacks on the XM Bank everywhere outside of the world except the state of Texas, we were still cheering for XM down here. So uh, we are a big traders in the state of Texas and anything that uh, impacts that we need to learn about. So, uh, but you had some pretty exciting news a little bit earlier uh, this year. You changed firms. I was wondering if you could just uh, tell us about that a little bit. Certainly. I changed firms. Just I changed my platform still have the same trade group, still doing all the trade compliance work. I just changed to a firm that has a larger transactional platform, lots of deals. And as you just alluded to, the uh, CFIUS work and the uh, changes in export controls and uh, the changes with all the tariff regimes are all important for transactional lawyers and advisors. So, with so that, I'm we're ready to talk about CIFIA. Well, whenever we can get uh, specific legal counsel in on uh, to advise on a transactional deal before it goes through, I'm a huge proponent of that. So, particularly in your area of trade compliance, the more we can get you in on deals before they are consummated, hopefully, the less problems that will be on the end. But uh, let's just go over to CIFIA. Could you start off by telling us what it is? It is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Now you know why there's an acronym for it, because it is a mouthful. And it has been around, actually. Uh, Gerald Ford established it in 1975, but obviously no one really paid attention to it. The purpose of it was a, uh, a response to OPEC, the Oil Producing Consortium, 
and the concern was that they were buying a little too much uh, in the U.S. securities and U.S. bonds, and they wanted to keep uh, an eye on that. So the committee itself, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. at the time, only met about 10 times between 1975 and 1980. And then it picked up in the 1980s because uh, defense matters and the export of uh, technology, technical development, and uh, sorry, technical data and defense products. And you'll see there were some amendments in 88. And through those amendments, the subject matter of the Committee on Foreign Investment expanded. However, I, I want to make sure everyone understands what it is and what it isn't. It actually is an interagency committee. So uh, these days it meets, I believe, on a once-a-week basis. And you have nine cabinet members or their designee that actually participate. And that's the cabinet organizations you'd expect, commerce, defense, homeland security, energy. And then you have a couple ex officios, that's labor and uh, a national intelligence officer. And then you have observer members of the committee. And here you get OMB, Council of Economic Advisors, the assistant to the president for national security, the assistant to the president for economic policy, and the assistant to the president for homeland security and counterterrorism. But so only the committee members actually have a vote and they actually do sit around and go over all these filings and make a decision. So what does the committee do? It reviews and approves foreign direct investment into the U.S. And the focus is on how it restricts or impairs national security. And the definition of national security has obviously broadened and changed over time. And that's what we're going to talk about as we talk about the recent changes. Some of these changes have mirrored uh, the policy of the committee, and they really just codified practices that were in existence. Like one example is there is something that's uh, called a pre-filing, and we'll talk about how many days the government has to review a filing, but say it's 30 days, as a practitioner and as a company filing, you've got to file this joint notice with your other party, so both sides of the transaction, and the lawyers get together and they actually get a draft together and they submit it to the committee in advance. And that is so it doesn't affect the timeline because the law hadn't changed in so many years and the government has limited resources. The government was pretty efficient at figuring out how to manage reviewing these cases. So what they would have you do is make this pre-file, and then they'd get back to you, and uh, there was no timeline for that or no time limit for that. And they now have taken that one activity, and they've actually put it in the law, so now it's part of the process. And the beauty from the government side is that once you then officially file and they officially accept it and their timeline starts running, they know what to expect and your filing is more complete than it probably was when it was a draft. Uh, some of the other changes we're going to talk about are, are new, and the reason that everyone really does need to pay attention to this is that the penalties for noncompliance can actually go as high as the value of the deal itself. So... Uh, you, you, there's no there's no way that you can't pay attention to what's included in the review of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. So how does, um, say I'm at Tom Fox Energy Company in Houston, I want to take in some foreign investment dollars. Um, other than picking up the phone and calling you, where do I start? Well, I would say you start by gathering some information. And unfortunately, and I'm not saying this uh, to benefit all the lawyers that you know, but it really is, uh, it isn't just to check the box, I answer a few questions, and then I can figure it out. Uh, the, the CFIUS process is 
policy driven and there are a lot of different factors that go into it. In a way, it's like a matrix. Part of it is where's the foreign investor investing? And I don't just mean the country or the state. I mean the postal code because one new factor is where the real estate is located. Is it located near a naval base? And are you a Chinese investor who could be trying to use listening devices to overhear conversations at the naval base? And I know some of this sounds sort of, you know, movie-like and Star Wars-ish, but that is actually a case from 2012. So location has been another one of those areas that we knew the committee was looking at. And now with these recent changes that have come into the law, real estate has been added and the proximity to the business, to potential national security uh, areas uh, is is an issue. Um, Another thing that companies must do is they must have their NAIS, NAICS code available because their industry code will help determine if they're going to be subject to the mandatory pilot program. They also need all the information of the potential buyer. And I mean, not just the corporate entity that's looking at making the investment or the buy or whatever it is, but we're going to have to go through the entire uh, ownership structure and in a sense, pierce the the veil, if you will, and see who's actually involved in it to find any potential foreign foreign ownership. So you have to have your ducks in a row. You've got to know what the new ownership structure is going to be like, and you have to know how much influence the foreign party is going to have. And I'll talk about that as I talk about these changes that just came into play with the new FIRMA legislation. So, and that really brings me up to a question of, can, um, I guess, what changed in November? Um, After, not just November, but I'm going to take it back just a little. After 9-11, obviously, there was a change in how uh, Congress, the administration, and I suppose the American public looked at foreign investors. We we became... uh, more hesitant, a little frightened about what actually is national security. This started with the Dubai ports matter, where a foreign entity was going to buy some UK control over some facilities at US ports. And our concern was, would that have national security risks? So the committee started broadening what they were looking at. So It's not just traditional national security. It could be food safety. It could be logistics, energy transportation. Uh, And and something needed to be done to take the law and bring it forward to where we are and to direct us into the future. And this also includes things like emerging technologies. For example, the concern was that there are foreign entities buying into startup companies, and those startup companies may involve things that could be benign, like driverless or uh, self-driving vehicles, but that technology could be used, taken somewhere else, and put in tanks that then fire on U.S. troops. So artificial intelligence, cloud-based technology, the whole array of, of all this emerging and foundation technology need to be reviewed. So uh, this is one thing that in the last year, no matter where you were in the political spectrum, you could agree on. National security was a serious issue. There were some in Congress that wanted um, export controls to be revised to address these topics. So the export control agencies are actually going to be part of the process. But as you know, we had just finished export control reform that Kevin Wolf had diligently spent so much time on and had done such a good job on. 
the decision came out of Congress that we are going to expand CFIUS and it'll be a backstop and we'll have another interagency committee that is going to work on the emerging technologies and foundational technologies and what that means. And that's going to fold into this review that I'm going to tell you about. So what changed in November is uh, the new law, FIRMA, which is another fun title because I can never remember it. Uh, shoot, I'll think of it as we go along. Risk. Anyway, FIRMA <laughs> passed in November, put in place a couple of things. They have procedural changes to CFIUS. Some of these things we've already talked about, they've now made uh, or added to the law, but they've also expanded the jurisdiction. They expanded it with real estate, as we talked about. So it's any real estate, whether it's a big parcel of land out in Wyoming or it's part of a building in downtown Manhattan. Real estate is now part of the regular voluntary CFIUS review. Another part of the expanded jurisdiction is that CFIUS will no longer apply to just foreign investors that are buying control because Congress felt that too many businesses we were buying less than control of the U.S. company, but they were buying enough of an ownership interest that they were able to, in effect, still have significant ownership to affect decisions within the company. So it really doesn't matter if you have 51% or you have 49% if you can affect business decisions. So the way the CFIUS program is now, the test is, if the foreign investor will have control, that's one test, but it also applies to what's being called non-controlling investment. And I'll, I'll explain it in a couple of seconds because there's more than that. There's also uh, the new real estate investment. And there's also now a provision that if a transaction is designed to circumvent CFIUS review, that can also make you subject to the review, which puts uh, a lot of pressure on the deal guys uh, how to how to structure the business in what way what may be uh, an advantageous position, keeping the foreign investor not as involved in certain aspects of the business because you recognize the CFIUS concerned, but such that it is not in the direct attempt to evade the law. Well, Doreen, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but I was wondering if anyone wanted uh, any more information um, along these lines, or they wanted to contact you directly uh, to seek your counsel, uh, could they do so? And if so, how would they do it? Of course they can. They, uh, anyone can Google me uh, or find me at my new law firm, Lowenstein Sandler. My email is D as in dog, E D E L M A N at Lowenstein.com, and that's L O W E N S T E I N. So, and I'm three- happy to talk to anybody. This has been a fascinating exploration, and this is one of the things I think is begun, going to become more significant uh, during certainly this administration and, and if there's a new administration going forward. So uh, thanks for taking the time to visit with me today. Absolutely, Tom. Have a great Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this part one of a two-part interview with Doreen Edelman at Lowenstein Sandler on the CFIUS requirements, and the new pilot program. Please join us again next week where we take up part two of this episode. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.